If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for the first 38 minutes, we do our current events intro. Uh, we have some great conversation. First, we start off with the great lottery debate. Watch Sal Razzle Whoa. Dazzle. Or as I call it, the debacle. <laughs> <laughs> then we talk about sunlight. Somebody's wrong. And fat cell shrinkage. Believe it or not, sunlight can actually make you leaner all by itself. Or shrink your penis. That's all we have to do. Just get in the sun. That's why brown fat looks Duh. better. Uh, we also talk about the importance of the sun, because without the sun... There would be no earth. <laughs> Black hole yes. sun. Boom. Won't you come? We talk about MDMA, the party drug, uh, and PTSD study. Nope, sorry. We didn't go partying at a rave. We actually talk about studies on PTSD and the use of uh, the drug MDMA, although otherwise known as Molly. We talk about Four Sigmatic. I mentioned <coughs> Lion's Mane and how much it makes me feel smarter. Uh, we are... Uh, sponsored by Four Sigmatic. If you go to four, spell it out, F O U R Sigmatic, S I G M A T I C dot com forward slash mind pump, and then you enter the code mind pump without a space at checkout, you'll get a massive discount. We also did our Thrive Market unboxing. Today, it was Adam's turn. Yay! What's in Adam's box? He got a lot of free gifts. Uh, not free, we actually paid for them from Thrive <laughs> Market. What the hell? They should be sending us, right? <sighs> Um, Let's give them the Catholic guilt. If you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump, this is what you're going to get. One month free membership, $20 off your first three orders of $49 or more, and free shipping. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, when you're trying to work on someone's squat, when you're correcting someone's squat, should you start with ankle mobility first, or should you focus on hip mobility? Mm, good discussion here. Or... Do you just do both? Why are we Why are we having to pick? Or you just say, fuck mm, it. I go right. knees. That's right. Uh, the next question was, does nitric oxide help with performance? In your car. In your car. Yeah. <laughs> Nitrous? <laughs> NO2. Uh, then, then someone asked us about uh, tracking. Now, we have an intuitive nutrition guide. You can actually find it at mindpumpmedia.com. Uh, we talk about tracking initially and weaning yourself off of tracking to eventually get into a state of intuitive eating where you know what to eat based on how your body feels do we think you can get to intuitive eating without tracking at all in other words can you just use magic hmm. finally uh intuitively we've i know this we've talked about how some people uh don't reach their goals because they just don't believe that they can even achieve those goals how do we overcome that lack of belief when we answer that question we're very empowering if you believe you can achieve yeah. you will become a believer <laughs> Well, powerful. Finally, uh, it's February. If you're still around, congratulations. You've made it through January. You're not one of those statistics of people who work out in January and then stop working out. February is what makes the serious people serious. Yeah. And if you are serious and you want to prove it to yourself. You know, let's be honest. Valentine's Day is around the corner. And to us. Nobody wants to be alone on Valentine's if Day. If you're that's, naked, you want to look good. That's a good, that's a good point, Adam. I uh, actually just read a study. If you're fit, you're far more likely to uh, attract a, a fit partner. Oh. So you want to have sex with someone that looks good, you got to start looking good. Anyway, if you're serious about your fitness, what you need to do is enroll in the MAPS Super Bundle. So the Super Bundle is several of our MAPS programs put together and discounted over 30% off. 30% off right off the top. Whoa. And it's a year of exercise a programming. Blade? A year of exercise programming. It's all set up for you. Fitness exercise demos, explanations, blueprints, phasing, the workouts change uh, every two or three weeks. Then every three or four months, uh, you get a completely new program. It's groundbreaking, but we have other bundles for other goals. And then we have individual programs if you just want to start with uh, a specific math program. All these programs can be found at mindpumpmedia.com. If you have any questions, there's videos on each of these programs where I personally break them down and explain them to you. Again, to get all of this, you got to go to mindpumpmedia.com. I think there's a conspiracy on the lotto that, and I would probably Google this. You're the Google master and see uh, how many. I am the Google master. I don't know why I thought of having this big like wizard like, hat. Yeah, you totally have like laser yeah. beams. You like never see somebody off. win the lotto from like the suburbs. 
Like it's never like some. Yeah, you do. <laughs> no, you don't. Yeah, you do. Google it. The last person I did. The last person. It's in my brain now, no. bro. I'm the Google Ooh. master. No. The last. You just summoned the, the Google last wizard. person to win the big, big Powerball, which Look was it up. Look it up. Hundreds of millions of dollars was this 21 year old do the, uh, suburban kid. Do this. Do the average income of a lotto winner. Oh, oh, I know that. Dude, but dude. but there's there's a there's a reason why that that is the way. What is. what is that then, Mister? But do you know, know but do you know why that is? Yes, I'm getting to that point. If you would stop just being so okay. certain about things you're not certain about, right. Google Google. Well, you tell me why. Fucking hey, guy. You tell me why then? Because they know it's going to go right back into the economy. No. That's yes. Not why. Absolutely. That's not why. Absolutely. That's not why. People and lo- lower income people buy more lottery tickets. That's a, there's a self selection bias. I, they dream a lot more. What did I just that's say? That's you not, said it, people. It goes back go, in the economy like go, it's a conspiracy. Go go go. Do average income a lot of winner? And what do we get? Let's see here. I want a I want a unicorn to come pay yeah. for all my problems. A, a what? A unicorn. God. Yeah. My daughter would summon, love a unicorn. Summon the unicorn. She would lose her mind. Fart a bunch of money on my lap. <laughs> Yeah. Oh wow. That, that's what it Look is. Look at all those statistics win. on there. Average average number of friends uh uh men winners give money to. That's funny. Uh, women women give only what <laughs> women are less likely to give any of their money away. Of course. <laughs> that's stingy. Great. So listen. Stingy. What's the conspiracy? I don't understand why you think there's a conspiracy. Because I think that they I think that they pick from areas that are lower income. Okay. Because because, because more lower income people win? Not that's not because of that. I think they pick from lower income areas because they think of it as a strategy that these people are more likely to blow all the money anyways and be broke. Which I, I'm pretty sure there's a stat on the people that have gone uh, that have won the lotto that end up blowing it all anyways. Okay, so so and so it's like you're really not you're you're losing the money, but you're not. Those same people probably blow it all and then spend half of it on more lotto tickets too. So here's so there's two two um, I guess uh, fallacies in that. One is that it's better. It would be better for the economy for someone to blow their money. False. And the second thing is that they're picking lower income people. Nobody is saying that it, it's better for the economy for someone to you blow their money. You just said it goes back in the economy. Right. It, which is, if it doesn't go, if they put it and they held it and they never spent it, yes, it would. Okay. So it's, Yes, it would. Right. Comparatively to that, yes. Right. So that's a common fallacy again. So taking your money and spending it frivol- frivolously is worse for the economy than taking your money and saving it or investing it. Because well, no, 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 not investing it, saving it or spending it in the economy. Exp- explain how you're going to, how that's. What do you think happens to the money that you save? Now, are these people taking these lottery winnings and putting it in a safe in their house? No, they're putting it in a bank. What does that money do in the bank? It collects interest and gets loaned on by other people. That's right. So the money in the bank, besides collecting interest, that money is what creates liquidity which allows other people to take that money and invest and the bank invest as well. So, and that's important. That's an important thing to note because you could people argue, would say you could that, argue that those people are taking that money and they're also buying from it, buying stuff at, a, that forces a business now to hire more people. Okay. Now you've created a job but, for somebody. But that's not the question. The question was blowing it and spending it frivol- frivolously. No, no, no. You, frivolously was your word. Blowing it was your word. Spending it back in our economy is what I said. Okay, so, so here's what took that spun on it, then try to talk certainties again. Okay, on it. so here's what's better. Here's what's always the best option. The best option is always to spend it the way you feel is best for you to spend it. So it wouldn't be better. There wouldn't be a conspiracy to have people spend more money because it isn't better. What's better is that people spend it the way that they it's truly not, it's want. It's better to. for the for the lottery, dude. It's better for them. It's not better for it's not better necessarily for the economy. It's better for them for you to go blow the money. You're less you're more likely to probably buy more mm. fucking tickets if you give it to somebody who's in a poorer neighborhood. The the statistics I guarantee will show you that they're they're more likely to spend it on, and lose it all again and buy a bunch of tickets and throw the money back out into circulation than they are to save it or invest again, it. Again, it's still in circulation when you save it, so it's not out of circulation unless you literally take the cash and, and store it under your mattress. So it's still in circulation, so that's not true. And then the second thing about taking the money and you know how you're going to spend it and whatever is that uh, how, uh, first and foremost... The reason why more poor people win the lottery is because more poor people play the lottery. As far as who's more likely to buy a bunch of tickets with their lock- yeah. lottery winnings, the amount of lottery tickets that a, a lottery ticket winner will buy, it pales in comparison to the average people. What, what motivates people to buy lottery tickets is 
circumstances, they're un- they don't understand the odds, which are ridiculous. They're I disagree of- with you on this one. I think it's a strategy for the lotto to do that, and I think it, it looks way better on television when you change somebody's life by them winning $10 million, and they're, oh my God, they were poor, and they got all this. It looks better for the lotto for that to happen. More people are going to be inspired to go and buy it because I, of that. I don't know. That's too. a hard thing If to some speculate. millionaire wins $10 million, no one gives a fuck. That's a hard thing to speculate, because if you just look at the numbers, and you look at proportions... It's that, not that hard. That's why it's fun to speculate yeah. but They're, when you come actually, in and start talking certainties like you know for sure that's bullshit well no the certainty i'm gonna that, call your bullshit the certainty the certainty that i know is that they've done the numbers and they've shown that proportionally speaking it's super random it's very random in fact there's people that spend well you found that on google so it must be true where did you find yours? I'm not. I'm speculating. Okay. So <laughs> I'm, I'm so, speculating. I'm admitting it. What you're doing is you're trying to counter no, my speculation I'm not. with certainties that you're not certain no, about. I'm telling you, it's, I'm telling you the numbers have been done and it's highly, it's super on, implausible. On Google. So the lottery it's put out some implausible. numbers for you that you, you trust. It's not the lottery. <laughs> There's people that devote a lot of time and energy into figuring the system out and trying to find how they can win the lottery. And they find that it's Random and random and random. Don't think for a second when you're giving away a lottery ticket that is worth half a billion dollars that there aren't people investing a lot of time and money trying to figure out where to buy the right ticket. Yeah. You need are- to know the numbers too of like every certain area. Like they would already have to have all that data. It's which there. Which would be a f- which would basically like that. That would mean it's the whole thing's rigged. You know, there's laws against buying a certain number of tickets, right? They'll actually there's actually laws that say like if there's a if there's a ticket that's worth a half a billion dollars, let's say that's your cash out, there's laws that say you can't buy a certain amount because then what will happen is you'll get corporations that'll look at the odds and say, well, if we buy you know, $100 million worth of lottery tickets with all these ranges, the odds of us winning a half a billion dollars are really good or whatever. They actually have some laws against that in, in some Have states. you guys ever met somebody that won the lottery? I, I know not some, the big one. I trained. I've met people that have met like big, one big money. Oh, really? Yeah. Tra- this single uh, mother and her daughter, and they're very unassuming. They they didn't want to obviously tell me that they got this fortune at their hands. Um, and this is back to when like I was trying to close at my service value being at a high price point, and you know I walked away from it. You know it's okay. You guys can't. You know, it doesn't make sense financially for you guys to invest in me in this this service, blah, blah, blah. Came back, they call me back, they tell me, and then they just like unloaded, like, oh, yeah, we won the lottery. And um, like, we, like, their mentality towards it was to um, reinvest to with more purchases of lottery tickets. It's hilarious. I was like, why? Like, I wanted to, like, I was like slapping myself in the face as I left. I was like, they spent like half their money of earnings back in into circulation. I wonder why that is. Have you seen the It's a mentality. Have you seen the the statistics on how uh lottery ticket winners how it affects their happiness and stuff later on and how it affects Yeah, they all end up getting depressed later. It's terrible. Yeah, no, it's terrible. It's a terrible vicious cycle that they do and they spin it to be all spectacular by these people that didn't have it's a lot of we money. Think when, money answers our our problems, right? right. We think money answers. And I think this They've actually done a few studies on this and found that actually quite a few found that over I think the number that they found for the more recent one was once you make over $75,000 on average a year yeah, your in the US your happiness doesn't go up that much happiness doesn't change with, with it more does money. break though at, at a point again there's there, I've seen that same study and it it shows it levels off and I've said this before and I uh, I think on this show where like there's this like 70 to 150 grand a year is like the same it really is like my I remember my lifestyle between that range as I was like kind of scaling Wasn't up. Wasn't that dramatic? Yeah, like I, it really didn't change. Like sure, and you know, maybe you have a little bit you know, nicer stakes every once in a while or maybe you're, you take a little bit step up on the, the your car payment that you normally would never justify paying before. You know, but very, very little changes. There's not a drastic difference because by the time it bumps you in the new tax bracket and by the time you see it in your pocket, it's not a major difference between that 75 to 150 <laughs> range. But I do believe that I saw that same study and that it was... The, then there's like another. It, it starts to curve back up, like at like a quarter million or something. So this shit. is a. It's. A, I love using this particular example when people tell me that um, you know in in free societies that money, more people need more money, and that would answer a lot of people's problems Fuck. because in a in free societies you're greatly rewarded for your competence and your skill and your work ethic. 
Like if you work hard and you're competent and you're smart, you're going to make more money. You're going to make a lot more money. It's just the way it is. And people who are not any of those things are going to do a lot worse. And giving them tons of money actually doesn't solve a lot of their problems. It does for like a couple of years, and then they go right back into who the said old it, Who cycle. said it best? P. Diddy? More money, more problems? That's right. Is that right? It was yeah. it who said that? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so smart. So, uh, yeah. so more current events. After we debunked your your myth, did, we did not debunk the myth, bro. Why did you? You're not. I'm not gonna let you end on that either. Just yeah. because you uh, you razzle so dazzle people, up, you right? razzle dazzle, razzle dazzle, you razzle dazzle people with your fucking fake Google stats yeah. doesn't mean you close me on your theory. I yeah. still am standing by my yeah, fucking yeah. what I'm speculating your brilliant, on your brilliant and, theory and admitting that I'm speculating, not trying to act like I'm for sure about that. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, so th- this is a this is a new um, thing that just came out. It's pretty interesting. So they did a study i'm trying to find where it was i believe it was in canada um let me look at the uh, the university anyhow i'll find it in a second but they found that um this was reported in scientific reports that sunlight uh, oh alberta in edmonton canada this is the university that there. sunlight was better than burns uh, body fat um, sunlight burns body fat which we've all speculated for a little while you know mm-hmm. um and they actually found a direct link and it was the blue light it was the blue light from the sun that causes the subcutaneous body fat, the fat that's right under skin, under the skin, to shrink. It actually causes fat cells to reduce in size, and it's not um, the result. Uh, it's not like it's not the down effect of the increase in vitamin D. Because when I used to speculate on this with myself, because I noticed this with myself and with my hmm. clients, that if I got more sunlight. I felt like I got leaner faster, but then there's always, a, is it because I'm more is tan? It, yeah, is it because you diet have changing? elevated mood? Yeah. And like all these factors are contributing towards right. you know, or the overall. You, or even your body heating up and then trying to cool yeah. back down, yeah. you're burning more calories. There's a lot of factors. Or my, well, and funny you say that, it's the opposite. When you get, when you're cold, your body trying to warm up burns more calories. When you're warm, you might actually have a slowing down effect. But nonetheless, I, it's so hard to isolate it. Well, they, they did a study at the at this university and they found that it's the blue light itself actually causes fat cells to shrink a little bit. Wow. Now, if we if we back up a little bit and try to unpack on that uh, or unpack that, it evolutionarily speaking, if you're not getting much sunlight, it makes sense that your body would want to store more because in the absence of sunlight, you're probably less likely to encounter food, right? Cuz Warm days, warm you know seasons. There's more food available, more plants, more animals. When it's snow and cold and gloomy, you're not going to find lots of food, and so your body probably wants to go into this hibernation. Yeah, like train store mode. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now, what are the studies showing though, as far as how significant of a difference? Oh, it was a small study, and I don't know how I don't know how significant they they were just showing that it causes fat cells to shrink. But if we add everything else into the mix, sunlight. You know, in some countries, I know in the UK, they did they they reported a study that said that they think that up to ninety percent of the of people that live in the UK are deficient in vitamin D. That's a big number, and vitamin D does act like a hormone in the body. And if you do have low vitamin D levels, you will for sure impact your ability to burn body fat. You're not going to burn body fat as effective as a, as efficiently or effectively. You're not going to build muscle uh, like you normally would. You're not going you're gonna have a lot of health problems or, or that are real subtle hmm. with low vitamin D. So there's that. There's also the changes in serotonin and dopamine. There's the and those then can promote more activity. So uh, sunlight is uh, important. It's an important part of the process. So although the, the the light itself may cause a direct effect on fat loss, in my experience, I don't know about you guys, but when you get out in the sun, even just being in the sun, it seems to promote more. Yeah, and then here's the other thing too. When you're in the dark a lot, I don't know about you guys, but do you you notice your appetite goes up a little bit? Did mm-hmm. you? Yeah, I noticed that. Did you look to see uh, what this is connected to? Like, if there is some company that's selling blue lights or something? <laughs> no. I, I mean, that's the first thing that always comes that's to mind. The like, study. Yeah. Right, right. So you started off with like a really good point, and there is some science to support, and then all of a sudden it follows you know, like a logical train of thought. Right, and, and then also it was like, from a di- so it's the Diabetes Institute that is looking at. They were trying to uh, figure out if they could... Which, by the way, just so everybody knows, you will see what I'm saying right now. You might not see it right now. It might not be where Sal got this, but it's only a matter of time before 
we'll see blue lights now. Yeah, you know, even it's if it's just like a micro influencer, you know, it's just right. this tiny little it's marketable. And yeah. how and now how funny would that be? Because what are what is everybody trying to wear on their face? Yeah, I know. Red all blue light blue glasses. blockers. Yeah. Blue light blockers. Right. So blue because blue light is the bad thing. No, you need blue light in the daytime. That's yeah. why when I was laughing, we're at Paleo FX. Well, that's, had the blue that's light. ridiculous. Yeah, it's like people are, you're wearing it wrong. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you don't wear it during the day. Yeah, wear it at nighttime. Uh. So, but uh, when I used to manage, when I used to have my personal training studio, I would train in the middle of the day because that's always the best time when you're, when you have clients because everybody comes in the morning at night. I'd lift in the day and then I'd go for a walk outside with my shirt off. And I had the best, I, I, I swear to God, it really did impact my recovery when I would do that. I'd feel so much better. And then it, and then if you go back to the golden years of bodybuilding, um, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger and all those guys in the 70s and 80s, that was like part of the routine, right? Yeah, they'd lift weights and then they'd and go hit out. the beach. Yeah, totally. So, how, how much do you feel it impacts just our overall skin to our skin health? Oh, big time, dude. I feel it's like- It's one of the treatments for skin issues. Yeah, I feel like that was, I, there was a definite huge shift in my life from- uh, all the way up to about 22 years old and then 22 on. And I never even thought I had any skin issues or bad skin. And I was in, I was in the sun all the time. I wakeboarded, I snowboarded, I was outside a lot. I played ball outside. I was definitely a kid that was uh, getting a lot of sun. And then I all of a sudden moved to the Bay Area, get this job where I work in this brick building that I love to do all day long. And I absolutely, and then I found I became passionate about training and fitness and I'm working 10, 12 hours a day from sun up to sun down and never getting any sun. And then poop, all of a sudden at 25 years old, here comes psoriasis. And then now I've like considered myself having terrible skin now. And it makes me always wonder, like, I wonder if I would have just kept that routine of, of making an effort to get out in the sun on a more regular basis. Mm-hmm. And then I also wonder did I fuck myself up because I was so extreme as a kid and then I went to the total opposite extreme and that has something to do with why that happened. Like It in- is ironic like the, when you think about the structure of the gym being so artificial and everything being so like um, like even the lighting, you know, the, uh, the equipment you're using, it's like all fixed in certain directions and uh, whereas like if we literally did all that stuff outside and like picked up random objects and got the same type of benefit workout wise, but now all of a sudden it's, <laughs> I mean, you just see how like that probably has a lot more benefit. It's just like, we've, we've sort of reconstructed the idea of that and put it in, in its own little like unique environment. That's oh. like, it's good. It's good for us. It's better than, you know, just sitting and, and doing right. our normal thing, but we're, we're still indoors. We're still confined. It's funny to me how much we fuck ourselves up um, it, with our knowledge and information. Like we get some information and some knowledge and then we tout it and we actually cause a lot of problems. Right. And sunlight is one of them because it wasn't that long ago. It was when I was a kid where the, the it was all about get out of the sun. Sun gives you skin cancer. It's terrible. It causes damage to the skin. Oh, yeah. Makes you look old, the, and you know sunscreen the shit out of sunscreen. Your kids, you Some know? countries, I know Australia Which had a federal policy. They had an actual national policy in Australia, where it was like promoted to throw to put skin uh, to put sunscreen on kids like crazy. Everybody wearing sunscreen. Mm-hmm. the The fucking irony of that is skin cancer went down a little bit, but all other cancers went up. Don't Quite you a bit. don't you feel like it's a that was an interesting example of us the way we do this whole pendulum swinging from left to right because there was like sun worshiping not that long ago and then it would become oh my god you can't do that there's yeah. cancer cancer this Melatonin, cancer that and yeah. then we went the other now we're going the other direction now we're kind of coming back again like okay we've demonized the sun long enough no, you, you guys just need, to need the right dose and right like, yeah for me like because I'm obviously I'm fair skinned and I got you know freckles and shit and. You know, if I if I do it too quick, I'm gonna burn the hell out of myself. Yeah, you only have two colors, red or white, right? Red or white, yeah. Or red or clear. But like yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm trying to get less ghostly, but you know, it's at the same time, man, I gotta really slowly introduce it. So it's funny because it's all the old all the old advice from like our grandparents right. is all coming true. Like what would they say? Oh, you don't feel good? Get some sunlight, get some fresh air, mm-hmm. and you'll feel better. And then I remember when I was a teenager, I thought that was so stupid because when I was a teenager, I thought, I'm like, what are you talking about? Sunlight, fresh air. I need medicine. I need yeah. like, and then we come Give back. drugs and a couch. Yeah. And then we come back around and it's as an adult, as I've learned this, when I was younger and I would get sick, I'd stay indoors like a hermit. Now, if I'm sick, 
I kind of force myself to go outside and sit outside in the sun, and I swear to God, it makes yep. such a big difference. Yeah, I've, I've definitely changed my mentality with that as well. Oh, it makes such a big difference in how you feel. And again, if you cut, if you dramatically reduce your exposure to the sun, will you lower your rate of skin cancer? You will a little bit, but you also statistically speaking, raise your risk of all other cancers. All cause mortality goes up, the goes up high to people or, or much higher to people who have who have no sun exposure whatsoever. Robin Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, so really the key is to not get sunburned. And you know what the secret to not getting sunburned is? Besides, obviously some people genetically are going to have a harder time getting tan or whatever. The number one way to reduce getting sunburn is the same way you reduce... If you work out real hard, that you cause too right. much damage. Lay off the intensity. Yeah, well, not only lay off the intensity, but how about if you train your body? Mm-hmm. Like if you never work out and you go to the gym and you do a few exercises, your risk of overtraining is way higher than if you're a fit person. Well, if you get a little bit of sunlight every single day and your body is accustomed to it, the odds that you're going to get a sunburn when you go do a walk in the park or some random you know, outdoor thing with your kids is way lower. And so I, I think the advice should be get some sunlight every single day, be smart about it, train your body, build up this tolerance so that when you do go out in the sun, you know, when you're out standing in line or something on accident, you don't get a sunburn on I know people that like they work indoors all day long. I have friends that they'll, they'll, they'll go outside in line. They'll wait in line for something for 40 minutes, come inside and poof, sunburn on their arms. Yeah. And I'm like, well, and they'll be like, oh, they blame me because I'm, they say that it's because they're white. And I'm like, well, part of it's because you're white, but the other part of it is. You literally are never outside, yeah. So you're super hypersensitive, you know, to sunlight. Yeah, so. I know. It's, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but I feel the same way about people that are like really germaphobes and avoid. Of course, if you avoid germs at all costs, and like you're always like cleaning everything, and you know, having these like um, you know antibacterial soaps and all these different things, you're not going to get that much exposure. Therefore probably you you might avoid like certain sicknesses, but what happens when you get it all of a sudden, you know, and you get ex- the exposure is intense and it's boom, it's going to knock you out. It is. It is. And the vitamin D is just, you cannot, that is, there's more and more evidence coming out that vitamin D deficiency is much more common than what we had previously thought. And I've actually read some articles where there are some reputable individuals who are saying that the range that we consider normal of vitamin D is actually low too. Oh wow! So even if you're within range, some of these people are saying that that needs to change. That that range actually needs I to be higher. That. I believe that for you sure. You know because and I, and they're basing this off of people who get lots of sunlight and then they test their you know have good a diet and who are out in the sun a lot and they test their vitamin D and it's much higher hmm. than what you know whatever range uh, that we're given. So some more cool news. Um, phase two trial. So this is now they've done phase one, and they've now done phase two trial on uh, MDMA, which is the popular, which is the drug in the popular street drug ecstasy or Molly. So MDMA is the active ingredient, has been shown in phase two trials now to have a sixty-eight percent. That's such a crazy number. Cure rate. I know it's crazy. Cure. Cure. Cure like, like rate. Gone. Like they'll test them. That's almost seventy percent of of people that have had PT, it's PTSD study, right? <laughs> yeah. You're talking about, yeah, they had the PTSD of that to get rid of it completely. That's insane, bro. It's it's, it's after only a couple of treatments too, right? It's after. Um, I need to look into the details, but it's not. I think it's like it's a little a bit of treatment. It's not a lot. I know no, it wasn't it's a, a lot. I read it's it. something like two or three treatments with a the therapist, and then there's like a few weeks of. Basically, three therapy. dead mouse concerts. Yeah. Right, <laughs> that's about what it equates to. No, yeah. but you you know what the cure rate is normally with MD with uh, PTSD, between eight to forty percent at the high end. So the high end, you'll see something like forty percent, but it's it's less than half. So you figure let's be let's be super uh, generous and say it's normally fifty percent cure rate with lots and lots of therapy versus seventy percent cure rate. With less therapy, that's a twenty percent difference. That is a major statistical change. That's massive, and it requires less therapy. Now, it is important to say that this that the way that they're doing this is with trained therapists. So these people are not just here's some MDMA, go take this at home, and then now are we see are we seeing more with MDMA than we are with psilocybin or LSD? I mean, is that right? Is they're that- doing a lot more studies on PTSD with uh, MDMA, psilocybin. They've done a couple um, end of life hmm. studies, so people with terminal disease, and then they'll give them 
psilocybin and then they'll talk to a therapist because one of the biggest and I went through this with I had, I had a family member who, who died of cancer and I saw this at the very end that uh, depression is extremely common in for obvious reasons with individuals who are told that they have a limited time to live so mm. you know you go to the doctor and like you have six months very common then that they have extreme anxiety and extreme depression so they're put on you know powerful antidepressant drugs and benzos and anti-anxiety, you know, other enzyolytic type medications because it's such a stressful thing. And what they did is they took people who were terminal and they did therapy under the influence of psilocybin and they found a dramatic improvement. So these people afterwards were much more at peace with the inevitable that they were going to die in, you know, whatever time. Mm -hmm. So I think this is great. I've heard, yeah, and I've heard that the the trials of the MDMA and, you know, the post-traumatic stress and, like, you know, from soldiers coming back and then, you know, going through these treatments, but also, too, like, uh, testosterone replacement therapy was the one that I heard a doctor really experimenting with um, and having decent that's, results with. That's interesting because I could see that the, the stress from the PTSD driving your testosterone sure, hormone, hormone levels, levels are off. To- and I that sure. wow, that's a really good point. I wouldn't even have thought to go that route. I bet you there's they're showing some really good positive benefits to that. Where was that at? Where did you? Yeah, see that? that was actually a doctor that was, I think I'm pretty sure he was on Joe Rogan, but um, he like part of the treatment he brought in um, one of the uh, soldiers that came back from Afghanistan and um, was talking about all these different like trials and, and different experiments they were going through. And MDMA was one of them that was like, you know, at the forefront, but uh, was also testosterone. testosterone. And then like, you know, the anti-inflammatory effects of that too. With the sure, brain. It, wow. is a feel so, good, it is a feel good hormone. Right, right. Steroids sure. and MDMA. It sounds like a Jersey Shore episode. <laughs> 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 you, you know, you send your, your <laughs> what, what's that? I got, I got some little DTF. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, DTF. yeah it's I, got, I got a laundry day. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, t-shirt time. Hey, hey, hey. Your husband comes fr- hey, back snooky. from therapy. Hey, what's up, baby? <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, I'm not going to treat you. Hey, you just come over yeah. here. She's like, wow, yeah, you're, yeah. you're cured, but you're an asshole now. Yeah. <laughs> Why is your hair so spiky? I don't like this. Yeah. So I was reading an article. Yeah, it's part of the uh, side effect. I was reading some some articles on PTSD, and uh, so I found this very fascinating. I, you know, I don't have any experience, any personal experience with PTSD, but I can only imagine maybe a little bit of experience, but nothing like what these individuals are, are are going through that have to get this, you know, these these treatments. And my personal view on PTSD was, first of all, I always think of soldiers because I know that a large percentage, much larger percentage of soldiers coming back from from battle have PTSD than the average population. So I always think of them. And I always yeah. thought to myself that it was caused by like your friend getting blown up next to you or your friends getting shot next to you or you're scared and that kind of stuff. But I was reading articles on it and a large chunk, if not a majority of people with PTSD who come back from war is not from that. That's a part of it, but that's not the main cause. A lot of it is that they do things in war yeah. that mm. completely shatter their understanding of themselves. Think well, think about it. Think about I mean, think about what we do as soldiers, man. Mm. Let's be real. Like you brainwash them. You bring them into boot camp, we break them down, right? You you absolutely Turn break them into them. killing machines. Yeah, you break them down and then you rebuild them up and you and then you train them to be killing machines. And, you know, some people maybe that that feels natural or normal for them or they don't they don't have a problem with it, but I'm sure there's a lot of people most that just doesn't sit well with no, them. No, most of it. Look at uh, Everyone in this room, if I were to ask you guys, hey, um, do you think you'd ever kill somebody? All of us would say, well, no, never. I can think of very few situations <coughs> where I would want to literally kill someone. I may want to hurt someone to defend myself, but I can only think of a few situations where I'd want someone to actually die. And even thinking about them, if I really place myself there, that would be a terrible experience. Yeah. And it's mainly because I've now identified that I'm a good person that killing is wrong and that I, because I'm a good person, I could never do this. So you're taking these people and you're putting them in war and although they they know logically like I need to defend myself, then they go out and they have to do it and they fucking blast someone and maybe they see that they kill someone and now it's like you have to grapple with the fact that you now have killed somebody and maybe you killed somebody maybe you killed some some kid maybe it was some 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 yeah, innocent 13 person. year old kid holding an AK at you because yeah. you go into a lot of these countries and you're fighting and it ain't 18 and over a lot of times no. it's 14 year old kids or 
you know, running out and doing, I mean, Vietnam was like that where they would give kids bombs or to run into platoons and do crazy. Right. And you'd have to shoot them. You'd have to shoot a kid running towards you. There's no to clear save. lines. No. And so it's this, it's this, this is what causes a lot of these problems because these soldiers come back and they're like, oh my God, I did these things. And I know I was supposed to, and I'm defending myself, but it was fucking horrible. And I had to become, because the, the, what I read in these articles was you have to, you have to make yourself a monster sometimes to do that because, you know, if, if, if I'm identifying with me, I'm Sal, right? Sal can't kill people. So I have to become something else in order to do this. And now what am I? Oh my God, I'm a monster. What is this? I don't know that this duality. It's like the ex- Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. Yeah. Kind so what, what they're saying with, with these drugs, with MDMA is one of the, the troubles with treating PTSD is being able to even go in and talk about and relive it because it's so painful and so horrible mm. that you don't even want to like, you let alone forgive yourself. You can't even get into it. You can't even talk about it. And what MDMA does is it makes you feel super empathetic. You empathize for yourself. Super forgive, and you, you empathize and forgive yourself and yeah. you can go in and understand it. And then this particular article was talking about how you make, one of the ways you, you cure PTSD is you make the person understand that the capability to perform evil is it rests within all of us all of us have this duality in what in us and what makes us good is choosing the good but that decisions but that potential is always there we're always we always have that you know all of us have that good and bad side there's a dark side and when you see horrible acts realize that they're human and so are you and understand that you once you can understand that accept that then you can go through the whole process of of processing and apparently mdma helps with that but it's getting a lot of federal funding because of these we've been now occupying some of these countries like Iraq for I mean there's kids born you know the kids now that are in their 20s who they've grown up their entire lives knowing that we've had you know occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan and all these different so we have people coming back all the time dealing with this and it isn't really a a, a good thing it isn't doesn't look very good when you start to look at statistics and realize that number one cause of death of soldiers is suicide. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That doesn't look very good for the military. So I think they're purposely investing in this shit because they're trying to figure this out. Like, how can we, until of course we have killer oh, robots. Shit. What would you say? 68% or? Oh, uh, the what? The, the, the cure rate? rate? Uh, yeah. 68% with this. That's, that is fucking promising. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. I'm on fire again, dude. Every time I take that lion's mane from four sigmatic, man, I need to, you guys need to start trying it out. I, I, I'm just not. I'm not sold on it because I don't like the taste, dude. That's oh, yeah. my. That's, that's my right, thing. Taste. You're the one who can do anything as long as it gets the performance you want from it or whatever. I just, dude, I love it. I'm a little bitch when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. I want to. I want to enjoy. <laughs> oh it, man. man, I, I do. T- I want to enjoy. It's it. my favorite natural nootropic, like lion's mane, little caffeine, ketogenic diet, and I am fucking absolute fire. Absolute fire. You know what we're gonna do? We're all going to take some next time, and even if you don't like the taste, and then see if you guys notice. <laughs> I, no, I've, I've already, I mean, I've- Have you done the Lion's Mane or just the chocolate? I've done all, everything. I've done oh, okay. all, everything that they've sent us, I've tried. The cordyceps. The, yeah, I've, and the chaga is probably the, the one I've, I've used the most, and it's not For that- the psoriasis? Yeah, just because of that, exactly. So, And that's kind of my thought process on taking that. It's like, I'm trying to deal with something like a, an autoimmune that is very annoying, right? So- it's, taking down a supplement that I may not love the taste I that I can make that switch but if it's just something where it's going to get improve energy or cognitive function like I'm like yeah that's I gotta I, I if I'm gonna take it I'm gonna have to like it or I'd rather have it in a pill form that's mm-hmm. just my personal opinion. yeah it's uh when the more natural you get with a product the less processed it is um, the more it's gonna taste like that product and it is a mushroom so it's gonna taste like <laughs> More like a mushroom. It lives on the bottom. Well, I just of like the, to keep it real. Forest floor. It is, yeah. and you, yeah. no doubt the reason why we're sponsored by them is we all stand by their product. I mean, they're they legit. have they have as far as like mushrooms, like they they're the best, dude. I mean, right. the best that we've come across and we've found, unless you literally go out there and go fucking find the mushroom yourself. If Cellucor made it, I'm sure it would taste like uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. blueberry raz. Yeah, yeah. blueberry raz. Lion's blueberry mane. raz. Lion's uh, mane. Yeah, no. And and I think if you're gonna do something like that, you would want that. So I I, I respect it that. It tastes like a Slurpee. Yeah. Hey, what are we? Are we boxing, Doug? We are. Today's oh, my box, huh? It's your box. Okay, so Adam's before box. you open this, What's in I have Adam's to. Box? <laughs> I, I'm a little nervous because I made fun of Sal <laughs> and his tampons. 
and I allowed cons- obviously what are you like 12 it's cons- not my tampon <laughs> 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 says who so we got you some maxi pads <laughs> yeah. is that what you're saying no so I, I Katrina did their our list so I don't know if she's gonna she's gonna embarrass me right now or not so let's see how she did all right here goes it Paper looks, out of the way. It looks uh, uh, heavy. It means Ooh, a big box. Oh, wow. What Look do we got here? What she get? We got goodies. Some maple syrup. Maple, maple syrup. Organic Thrive Market brand. Uh, oh, they make maple syrup. Uh, you've been eating them waffles Dude, or what? So it probably got, she probably got our pancakes that we really love there. You did. You got yeah. birch, birch benders. Oh, that's oh, so good. protein. Yeah. Oh, this is cool. Good girl. Yeah, this is good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all about these pancakes. Oh, get this. We got some Newman's own premium dog treats, peanut butter flavor. Oh, for my oh, boys. They got dogs. Hey, uh, just no, in time I'm going to have to hit that up. Just in time for a trip there. That's a good call. Justin, you can't have any. Oh, my boys are going to be You know, it's crazy. It looks a lot like these other packages. I want to oh, make sure. I, I probably <laughs> ate that and not even known. Thanks for pointing that out. You want, it's yeah. this peanut butter stuff. So like, I got to make sure. <laughs> I had it had like it three probably in my would mouth. taste all right. It probably tastes all right. Probably. Have you guys ever eaten dog food? I was yes. looking. I was actually yeah. at yeah. what you call it, uh, no. Petco, and I was looking at the ingredients. I'm like, this all natural thing. I was like, man, this is all stuff I eat. Yeah. You know, it's none of it was, <laughs> none of it was something I, I don't eat. Every bit of the every bit of the ingredients that went into this dog treat was something yeah. that I consumed. I, I mean, well, it I mean, used to be the quality. Like they would just take like just nasty shit and put it together. Like oh, oh be, dogs will eat it. I thought it was like horse meat before. Yeah, it was like rat meat it used, and shit. Used to be like what is that? Balsamic vinaigrette oh. or vinegar. Balsamic vinegar, very nice. Yeah, from Napa Valley. Is it not organic? It is. Uh, no, it's not so right. Thrive does you're, have you're some living on the edge. No, it's non-GMO. It's always non-GMO, but it's not always organic. And we have some fourth and heart ghee that's from grass-fed cows. Oh, they got the ghee there too, Ooh. huh? Oh, they added a uh, Himalayan pink salt. I love ghee. Oh, they added it in there. That's we cool. use a lot of ghee, bro. I I can literally eat ghee like by yeah, itself. I, I use ghee out all the time. That actually came. I believe I really started using it uh, when Ooh, we that's started. A good hanging one. Up. Look at that. Yep. That is a good ghee. You don't want this one. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. Now we got Bragg Organic Extra Virgin Olive Oil. There you go. Oh, well, I just got some of that. Did you? Yeah. Are these plastic bags recycled? Is that why they're all green looking like this? Is that are they recyclable? I have to. Or be, maybe right? they already. Yeah. Already, they're edible. You should already use. They're edible. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's Nothing it. embarrassing. I, I use mine as good a dental job. dam. Good job, honey. I can't wait for these pancakes. No. All right, bring on the the bird. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. First question is from John Alva 7. Oh, that's our boy. When correcting someone's squat initially, is it better to begin working on ankle mobility and then focus hard on hip mobility or vice versa? That's a good question. Ooh. So he was having a debate with another trainer um, because I saw this question and th- I guess they were debating. This is debatable. Yeah. It is, right? Yeah, it you is. could debate this. You know, I, you know what the answer would be for me? Depends. Both depends yeah. on yeah the well, individual obviously. I'd say both. Like if you're going to work on mobility, you probably want to work and you just yeah. go right out. Well, I don't think you have to pick. Well, what's more obvious? Well, right? you could look at it from that here's, perspective. Here's here's like uh the here's what I could argue one way, right? And I could argue it the other way, but one way to argue that I would work on hips first and then ankle is you could actually crutch the ankles until you you do that yeah. by by wearing uh, and that's yeah, what I did shoes right so yeah. I wore squat shoes while I really addressed hip mobility and was then eventually worked on the ankle mobility and so I was still able to squat with pretty good depth and uh, get great workouts while I was still working on the hip mobility got really good hip mobility and then I worked down the ankles now that being said if you were to walk into an office like Dr Brink I guarantee he would he would work you from your feet up. Hmm. Um, so the thought process for it and thought process for him is like, that's the way he would think he would think from the ground up, work everything, sure. work everything that direction. Now the thought process for me and doing the hips first was I didn't want, I'm stubborn. I don't want to stop, like stop squatting. Like Brink would say, if you're broken down from the foot all the way up the kinetic chain, stop the squatting, just work on your, work on your, your movement, your mobility, and then, and then go about 
squatting later where I was stubborn and, you know, especially back then, that's when I was competing. So I want, I don't want to lose my aesthetic. So I'm still squatting with squat shoes while I'm working on hip mobility. Once the hip mobility was good, then I moved over to ankle mobility. Yeah. I, I actually agree with you. Um, I, and the reason why I, I would, that's hard if you. I had to pick, well, usually wrong. <laughs> I had to, <laughs> so many points. Yes. I would, uh, the reason why I would Lottery focus on, science. the reason why I would focus on hips first, if I had to pick is because I feel like hips are easier to, to correct than ankles and feet. Ankles and feet are, boy, that is a very, there is, there's a lot of stuff in the ankles and feet. Some people's feet or a lot of people's feet are so fucking turned off mm. that like they can't even figure out, if I tell them to activate this muscle, activate that, like they can't even do it. Whereas with the hips, yeah. if your hips are off or they're not firing the way they want, I can put you in an exercise and make you do it. And because the movement is easier to understand, like a hip thrust, it's easier to, to maybe work on hips where when I'm working on the foot, like have you ever tried to get someone to do short foot that has no idea how to activate their yeah, foot? No, it's, it's, it's like you're telling them to levitate for an animal off the floor. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, yeah. No, I, I totally, I mean, but for that reason, you could also argue that it's the most needed too. Well, that's, that's just it. It's, it, right. it, it's, that's a what matter Brink, of that's like, what Brink would say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are you really, are you fixing the root or are you just fixing the symptom? And so like hips to me is a symptom of the, the the ankles and so like what you're doing is you're you're allowing you're band-aiding the process to get down towards the root problem right which takes fucking work and it's hard and it's like you said short foot is like it's like i can't even really understand that still with my feet like we just don't communicate like that yet you know <laughs> i haven't established that and just getting the getting that to um become familiar is going to take you know, thousands of hours in addition, uh, pattern wise versus like something that you can address with your hips that maybe the mechanics you can adjust mid exercise a lot easier. And, and it's something that, um, you know, you can, you can kind of scale, uh, and, and, and still work in, uh, versus like, this is going to totally like change the hard wiring of the way that your kinetic chain is, is established so i like talking about ankle mobility because it's so overlooked yeah and it oh, was we, i had was, zero right zero knowledge on it yeah. up, up until we met brink yeah i it, mean very little yeah ankle mobility and it was a major game changer for me major game changer for me like i now consider myself a pretty good squatter i don't think i'm great but i think i'm a pretty good squatter um as far as overall mobility and my form and strength and a, a lot of that limiting factor for me was my ankles. And I didn't know it. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that it was a major limiting factor because I wasn't looking there. I was so focused on my upper body and, and my hips that I wasn't really paying attention to the pronating of my feet and the lack of ankle, ankle mobility and the ability for me for my knees to travel further over my toes. So when I started addressing that, it, it just really completed my squat. And, you know, first was the hips and I, I addressed that. Had I known... Now, what I know now, I probably would have started on my ankle mobility because I real I recognize what a big difference that it made for me. Hands down, though, like talking about where I'm at now, if there's three moves that I are I will never lift <coughs> without doing these three moves, especially if I'm training squats, deadlifts, any lower body, and that's 90 90 my my, my 90 90 transitions and moves, my uh, lizard with a rotation, and my combat stretch. Those three have mm -hmm. I've gained the most return from those three uh, mobility priming movements agreed, agreed, that yeah. they are a staple. I just do not. And I, of course, want to spend more time and I try and do other things and, and get better about being consistent. But that is something that I have. I what saw such changes sort of walking yeah. barefoot a lot more right. consistently, which has been a game changer for me personally and like activating my toes individually, which is nothing I've ever focused on. Because like, like my feet are literally like smashed and I have like hammered toe and, and <laughs> the my my operating system is to grip pull grip pull like as one unit and to like now, a sloth. yeah to like <laughs> segment it and to spread them out uh, like i was like holy shit like what like it didn't make sense and 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 just doing that now you feel the difference in stability Dude, you uh, feel the difference in the way that you react you move you transition uh everything like one small little like micro dysfunction 
in your foot, your ankle, it, it, it cascades and it, and it creates like a louder problem up into the hips. Dude, how fucked up is that? That most people, just because we're, you know, modern life, you put a, as soon as a kid walks, you put shoes on them, right? Know. Yeah. How fucked up is it that, imagine if that, if it was like, obviously it wouldn't happen with our hands because we use them so much, but imagine if your hands were like that, where you looked at your hands and you, just couldn't. And you <laughs> couldn't really move your fingers and it's like- It's like a fin- you're it's like, like it doesn't work. Oh. That's what we've done to our feet. That's exactly what it is. And uh, athletes, especially big athletes, are the worst at this. Yeah, yeah. Mainly because, uh, like, I'll tell you what. If, uh, unless if you're queasy, don't do this. But no, if you're, do this, Doug. Put, pull up uh, Google LeBron James feet. Yeah, there you go. Oh, if you look at Google LeBron James I don't feet. See if this. you look at the feet of pro. Uh, athletes, be, mainly because they 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 probably grew so fast that they probably wore tight shoes all the time. Yeah, and they but they compensate so well. well obviously, these N- NBA players Bro. have like <laughs> like twenty inch. Bro, you ever seen like a picture of really bad teeth that require braces? It looks like their toes need braces. Like toes are on top of each other, <laughs> and it just there you go. Look at that, bro. Ugh. What is that? That's his pinky at the end, bro. That's his, well, it's all smashed look, in. Look, look at that. That that. Toe is smashed on his big toe. Bro, that pinky. His pinky toe's on top of look, everything else. Looks like it's growing out of the top of his what foot. What in the fuck? And his, his, <laughs> and his, his oh. middle toe is on top of his big toe. Wow. 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 I mean, think about just how- smashed in right. everything. Everything. Right. Isn't that crazy? It's cra- and that, what's crazy it's, about and that's, that- That's too far beyond- That's, that's, that's you can, ar- arguably can, one of the most athletic men in the world. Yeah. Has, has some of the worst, which you got to know that he's on- Oh, look, is he getting his feet worked on right there? Dude, I would hate to work on. Look at him. They look like they have arthritis in them. He's probably like trying to separate the toes. Just yeah, Yeah. dear life. No, you know what? Uh, I hate to say this, but if you're an adult and your feet are kind of messed up, you're never going to get them as good as if you had worked on them from the beginning. But you can make improvements. Oh, Oh, click on the one to the right. Huge difference. Click on the right. Look at look at that. These are women who had their feet bound. Oh my god! Look look at the little shoes she wore, and look what happened to her foot afterwards. Worst shit. Uh, That's another thing. That's disgusting. If you if you if you want evidence of how much your feet can be molded by your shoes and stuff like that, look up like pictures of women who used to bound their feet. These are in you know in, in countries like China where they. Uh, valued small feet that would bind their feet since they were children and the whole foot and the toes tuck underneath and it looks like this little tiny hoof Ugh. that they walk around with. See, when I see that too, I, I wonder like, you know, if you were to change nothing about LeBron James, but that maybe his parents got him in like gymnastics when he was a kid in addition to everything else that he was doing, right? And then he got into like training his feet and working barefoot. Like, I wonder if there if we would see any at all or how much carry over into his performance now as an athlete and or the potential injuries that he's going to have down the road. Oh, I, I I guarantee he would have been less injury prone for one. Right. It just it just has to be that way. So here's it, the other question, right? Just let's say the recruitment patterns he would have established. Let, let's say you take an athlete like this who's fucking exceptional, but they've got fucked up feet, and then you're like, Oh, cool, I've identified something that's messed up on you. Let's spend a bunch of time fixing this. Do you think that would improve his performance or decrease it? Oh, it would decrease it for sure. Yeah. Especially yeah. at that level because he's so created his own patterns yeah, and everything. Yeah. It's just like what's solidified. It's like what they say with like a like a golf swing. Like if someone's been golfing and they never got lessons and they've been swinging forever. Well, didn't Tiger Woods trying to do that? And then it took him like two, three years to to really like develop this new swing. And, oh, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and it and it, it he never really got that same uh, response back. Yeah, mm-hmm. once you've once you've put in that five thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand reps into something like that, you've solidified that recruitment pattern so much that trying to break that, although it may be better for health, would probably decrease in performance. And I think mm-hmm. that's where someone like that is at. It's just like it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Next question is from Mark Kalhoff. Does nitric oxide help with performance? Oh, the the old uh, pump. No, NO2 explodes. Pump no category of supplements. You know, it's been a long time since I've actually, I remember when this first got hot and I remember reading deeper into it and telling people that, first of all, all the studies that they show on this, there's no real proof that we can uh, ingest 
these these things to increase the nitric oxide into our blood. So it's really it's one of those. It reminds me of like when supplements like leptin come out, like a leptin pill comes out or whatever. Like that so oh, yeah. we know that rep, leptin just and ghrelin increasing that it's not going to right. Just it. just taking it in doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to increase the levels into your, in your blood just because you supplement yeah. it. Well, and, what they do is they, they we know that certain amino acids uh, like arginine, for example, are required to produce or make nitric oxide. So then what they do is they take that and they say, oh, cool. If we take arginine, then that means we'll produce more nitric oxide. Now, this is the same mentality as somebody saying protein builds muscle. I'm not going to lift weights. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to dramatically increase my protein intake. It's going to build more muscle or calcium is needed for bones. I'm not doing anything else but taking extra calcium and that'll make more bones. Not necessarily. Your body first off, needs to want to make more nitric oxide. And if that is a limiting factor, then it may help. But we do know that arginine is actually a terrible way to raise, raise nitric oxide because it gets degraded and destroyed before it hits your bloodstream. Citrulline is a better alternative uh, for that because citrulline gets converted to arginine, which then now it's in your bloodstream and theoretically can raise nitric oxide. Now, the question is, can nitri- does nitric oxide improve performance? Well, If you have nitric oxide production problems, if you're older, um, then maybe it may actually help you. If you're young and healthy, probably not. And the nitric oxide precursors or whatever that have been shown consistently in studies to have an effect, and it's not a huge effect, but to have an effect is not the, uh, you know, citrulline and bodybuilding supplements that you find in your pump supplement. It's actually beets, beet juice. Good old-fashioned beet juice contains compounds that get converted to nitric oxide, and they've studied it in endurance athletes where they've noticed, a, in some studies, an improvement in uh, performance. But otherwise, no. And, you know, one of the best ways to increase your nitric oxide is to just be healthy because then you're going to have more. And what? Okay, real quick, nitric oxide is a gas released by your blood vessels that dilates your blood vessels so they kind of relax, and it allows for... Uh, more, more blood flow, more blood flow, more, more oxygen, more nutrients. Right. Therefore, more muscles. The theory on on right. this whole idea, right? And what they did in the supplement industry, which is absolutely brilliant, is they you know they identified that the pump was one of the most sought after things that people um, try to get when they work out. Everybody loves the pump, right. and so they so figured how do we out increase this process. Yeah, how do we attach a supplement to getting a better pump? Because we don't need to sell a pump so much. Like everybody likes to have a good pump. And so what they did is they created uh, supplements that had stimulants in them so that you felt really jacked when you lifted weights. And then they put in arginine in there because we know arginine turns into nitric oxide, which is true. It just doesn't do a very good job when you eat it. And they created this new pump line of supplements, which were easy to sell because people like to have a good pump. And they were easy to sell because the first time you ever took one of these supplements, you felt awesome, mainly because it had you know 300 or 400 milligrams of caffeine in it. So... Uh, if I if I were to make a list of supplements that you could add to your repertoire for things that will give you really good benefits, nitric oxide boost boosters would be way at the bottom. Right. You know, I would look at things like and most of the benefits going back to what you just said is. Com- I mean, I like to. I think that's in almost most all fat burning pre workout nitric oxide pump enhancer all these fucking supplements. The biggest game changer in all of them is the caffeine. Yeah. Is the caffeine. Caffeine is like the most beneficial thing which you could get for a massive bottle for like next to nothing. Oh, <laughs> caffeine by itself is super cheap. Yes, yeah, so you could get some raw caffeine. And if you don't believe me, read the label, figure out how many how much caffeine is there in there. And then because most caffeine pills are like only like 25 milligrams. And most of the things you're talking about have like 300. Yeah, you want to take, yeah, take between 100 to 300 right. milligrams for But most you want to feel crazy, take 600 to see how you feel. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't recommend six hundred. <laughs> but I mean, if you're the if yeah. you're the guy or girl that's chasing that crazy feeling, they're like, "Oh my god, try this supplement out. You'll feel crazy." Well, if you want to feel crazy, go take six hundred milligrams no. of caffeine. Yeah. See how listen, you feel. Crazy. listen, be careful. <laughs> for some people, six hundred milligrams will be an overdose. I would say start low, but low, know what your dosage is. You know what I mean. With my yeah, point yeah, is, yeah, I course. would never recommend. I would never take six hundred. Yeah. I remember Just the first take time with truck drivers. I remember taking, when Joe you know I mean? D sent over when we were talking to Joe Donnelly oh, his two, two, two years ago, and he sent over. Over his pre workout, and he was just like, Man, our, my pre workout shits on everybody's, and he was like hyping it all up. And I flip it around and I go, 
holy fuck, I have never seen a pre-workout that has 400 milligrams per serving per serving yeah. in it. I'm like, yeah, no, no fucking no wonder. wonder you yeah. feel like you're on cocaine after you take it. Like, no <laughs> shit, dude. Like, it's the closest thing to that. Like, it's not, and the, but yet all the promotion of it and what they how they market it and stuff is yeah. the perfect ratio yeah. of this and it has the at the right amount of and that's how like supplement companies are so funny they get into all these like semantics over like who has the exact right amount of ratio yeah. and I love when kids are always asking me like well you know I heard this one is better for absorption it's just like dude that's all the jargon no, that, it, that's it's, all the jargon they fucking razzle yeah, dazzle you guys with time that's razzle dazzle okay. right there at yeah. it's best it dude. releases at a specific time right yeah, if you know <laughs> okay. If you here's what they'll do. If a supplement has mark has proven themselves in the market, so let's say creatine. Creatine came, I remember when creatine came out, it was like the biggest fucking thing ever. It was right. super expensive. A 30 day supply of creatine cost something like and we're talking back in the mid nineties. It was like sixty bucks. It was like sixty dollars yeah. in the mid nineties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was super expensive. And it was breakthrough because it was one it was finally a supplement that actually did something. Because every other And than it that, was like all the same. And then they're like, fuck, we gotta we gotta differentiate yeah, make it was, money somehow. So we have to label it something else. Because well, it, it proved was, itself. Well, yeah. yeah, it proved that there was there was a huge market there and leave it to us. What will we do then? Then we start splitting the market up by going like, okay, let's put BCAs in Let's there do too, liquid right? form, yeah. let's do let's let's sell the creatine time, phosphate, yeah. creatine citrate, creatine. You need grape juice with it. Yeah, no, it's uh it, it's just like that. They find something that works in the market and nitric oxide you know supplements or supplements that give you a pump or supposed to give you a pump mainly pre-workout supplements definitely have proven that they that people want to buy them because they feel great and so now you've got a huge market and you've got all these different versions of all these different things that give you a better pump here's the thing too with supplements supplements may show benefits in certain people or certain populations of people which but doesn't mean it's going to work for you so if you have high blood pressure or arthrosclerosis, you know, arginine and citrulline may actually benefit you. You may actually notice a reduction in blood pressure. You may actually notice mm. some health benefits. But if you're a healthy person, it ain't going to- That's a really good point. I, yesterday, I was, I was meeting with this trainer, a younger guy, and he follows Mind Pump, listens to everything. He was, he's been paying attention to uh, what I've been doing with my testosterone. And he told me, he's like 25 years old, right? And he tells me, he goes, hey, I was going to go buy those- um, you know, how are you liking the juve light and how are you liking um, the testosterone uh, it, pills that you're taking right now? Is it helping you? I was thinking about going to get it. And I'm like, is there something wrong with your testosterone? And he's like, no, but I mean, are, is yours increasing? And I said, well, yeah, but you can understand, like, I got fucking terrible levels, dude. Like, so a little bit of that gives me a little bit more, which makes a difference for a guy like me. But if you're normal, dude. It won't have any effect on it. Yeah, you won't feel anything from it. It actually waste, won't even I have an like, effect. Don't, yeah, I said, don't waste your money. No, man. and here's, mm -hmm. here's a good analogy. If I took somebody, if I took a group of people who have a deficiency in magnesium, let's say they're not getting enough magnesium in their diet. If I give them magnesium, they're going to notice all of a sudden clear thinking, better sleep. They're stronger in the gym. They have way less anxiety. Depression is gone. It's going to be a miracle fucking substance that I gave them. Now, if I gave that same magnesium to a bunch of people who have no magnesium deficiency, they're going to notice nothing, zero. So it's, it's, that's an analogy for what we're trying to explain here is yeah. if you have issues with blood pressure, if you're older and, you know, and the older populations tend to have issues with producing nitric oxide, again, probably poor diet and stuff like that, a nitric oxide supplement may actually help. If you're an average healthy person, don't waste. I would say yeah. probably don't waste your money on it. Uh, creatine, beta alanine has some benefits for, but it's real small for elite people and your stimulants and you're pretty much set. Next question is from Sat Manchez. In the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, it recommends initially tracking calories and macros and then weaning yourself away and into intuitive eating. Do you think intuitive eating can still be done without tracking first, as long as you're disciplined and listen closely to your body? I don't. That would be way harder, I don't. right? I don't. Yeah. I, I, I mean... I don't even I don't even like it for someone like me where I'm at in in this career fucking 16 mm. years later. I still Well, you're just going to find out how off your intuition is. Yeah, it's just I've never met a client. I've never been able to 100% put it together for myself. I'm still learning things about how food affects me to this day. Uh, I don't know, man. I'm not I, I mean I I mean it, theoretically yeah, yeah, theoretically, you, yes. But but realistically, no. I, I completely agree with Adam. I mean, there's okay, we have to understand 
with intuitive nutrition is you go through the classic four stages of learning when you're doing this. And the first stage of this is where you're unconsciously incompetent, which means you don't know what you don't know or you don't know that you don't know. And so you have to move from there. If you can't move from there, if you don't figure out what you don't know, there's no way you could get to intuitive eating. And the first step to moving for, to, to moving out of there is to go from unconscious incompetence to conscious competence. And tracking does that. Once you start to track, all of a sudden, and this happens all the time with clients, all of a sudden they're like, holy fuck, I didn't know there was that much sugar in that. I don't know I was eating this many grams of protein. I had no idea I was eating this many calories. I had no idea that I was lacking in my protein intake. It's like expecting to be able to, to learn multiplication and division without learning addition and subtraction. First. Or not even knowing what a number is. Right. I mean, you know that, you know I, mean <laughs> you, I mean, if you tried to, you could, you, theoretically, you could have somebody teach you multiplication <laughs> and division, but it just makes way more sense to learn addition and subtraction first since those tools are necessary for you to be successful at multiplication and division it's, it's a step further it's you wouldn't even know what numbers are because you're unconsciously incompetent so well, i mean you, i'm you sure gotta, this person's aware of you, food mac like but protein, they don't carbon fat yeah but they don't without tracking they don't know that they don't know is my point you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah, yeah. so you got to go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. Now you know what you don't know. And then from there, you move to conscious competence, which is also tracking. What that means is I first start tracking. Now I see what I didn't know. Now I consciously aim for macronutrients targets and I aim for calories. That's the conscious competence part, which you can get stuck there, which isn't good. You don't want to have to think about what you're doing all the time with your food. You don't have to think about planning everything out you know, ahead of time and all that stuff. Then the next stage is intuitive eating, which is unconscious competence, which takes a long time to get to. And that point is where you've tracked, you've aimed for targets, you understand what's in the food, you're making the connections with your body, you're creating positive connections and negative connections with food, you're identifying how foods affect both your mental state and your emotional state and your physical state. And then you can move to a point where it's, it's unconscious. You're in this flow state where you reach for what you should be eating and it's kind of a natural state. And that's a great place to, to live in because it's much more uh, maintainable forever. But to get to that point without ever tracking, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and say that's probably impossible. I don't know how you would even, you would even get there if well, you didn't know you what would, was in your food. The only way would be to fail a ton of times. And not or, even realize it, but. or or being okay with your lack of results. I mean, if you're somebody who's just like, eh, you know, I want to try and intuitively eat and make better decisions for myself, but I don't really have any fitness goals where I'm trying to gain weight or lose weight or build a bunch of muscle, and I just want to practice some better habits. Like I could see somebody kind of going that route, but it just I don't know anybody that I've never trained a client that wasn't trying to eat better or exercise to better themselves and without measure without measuring that or tracking at one point it's really tough to measure like how do i know for sure that what i did the other day was something that was good for my body you and, need something objective and the reason why i think we all feel so passionate about this is cuz i've done this hundreds of times with clients where i do a test like you know, tell me where you think you're eating. Tell me what you're doing, and then we track. And Nobody it's like knows. Way off. It's always yeah, that's way off. You always know? happens. Clients give you this answer like, "Oh, I eat really good. Like, I don't eat a lot of sugar. I don't do this. I don't do." They tell you everything they don't do, yeah. and then you start what about tracking all those sodas you had. Yeah, you start tracking, and it's way off from what they think. Yeah. So, you know, I, I I think it's necessary to do. That. And here's the thing too: like, even when I track, like, so let's say that I'm I, I'm noticing that. Uh, my stool is off, right? And so my first thing before I just assume that it's like a fiber deficiency is to track and to pay attention. And then I go, oh, well, look at that. You know, three days in a row, I've been under consuming fiber. Okay, now let's reintroduce some more fiber and then let's see how what happens to my stool. Oh, look, my stool changed. Then even after that, I'm going to test it again. Well, let my fiber drop a little bit. Let's see if it affects it and again. There you go. And then, you know, I'll mul I'll do that multiple times tracking before I'll just assume that, you know, cuz I get too many people that try and correlate Oh yeah, for sure. You took this, and so you're. This is probably a reaction because of that, or you feel this way because of this. It's like, whoa, wait a second. 
I'm not going to draw that conclusion off of just maybe. Like, I don't have the proof. I, I want to first prove to myself that that's more than likely what's going on before I just decide I'm going to go ride ride this bike with no hands. And you know what people are really good at? We're really good at fooling ourselves. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yes. you need to have, to start with, you need to have an objective measure that you can look at and then measure against it because if you just rely on your intuition which is something that you're trying to develop in the first place yeah. you're fucked you have no you have no reference you have no objective basis you, you have to nothing train your intuition first you got to get to that point first and, and to get to that point information is extremely important and tracking provides that lucky hoagie you have talked about how people sometimes may not reach their goals because of a lack of belief that they can how do you overcome lack of belief and just do it? Um, two things. First, uh, you have two scenarios here. Let's say you want to, and just for argument's sake, let's say you want to lose 30 pounds. And your two options are, I work out and I change my diet to lose 30 pounds and I may succeed or I may fail. And the other option is I don't work out and I don't change my diet, in which case we know the result of that is guaranteed. You're guaranteed not to lose the 30 pounds. So you don't need to necessarily believe that it's going to happen. Just believe that the option for it to happen is much more likely if you do something and the option that it won't happen is guaranteed if you do nothing. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is to be okay with it not happening. Like be okay and say to yourself, here's a deal. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to bust my ass. And if I, you know, we'll talk about business. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to bust my ass. And I may not ever get to my success level. I may never make a million dollars a year. Um, And that's going to be okay. But it's going to be okay because at least I know that I went out and I tried because if I didn't do anything at all, well, fuck, that sucks. Now, the problem with that is people would rather... They would rather not fail. They would rather not try than fail. Mm -hmm. Like it's easy. Like it's easy for me to be like, you know, hey Sal, how come you're not a how come you're not a millionaire, man? Be like, I don't give a shit. I don't even try. Like that feels good on my ego because it's like, I don't even I don't even try. Therefore, I'm not a you know. Hey, why aren't you in shape? Risking it. Yeah, why aren't you in shape? Well, I don't work out and I don't eat right, and it's good. It's cool because I don't because I don't even take a chance and try. Therefore, I've never failed. Hmm. That is a shitty way to live. Life like that sucks, you know. It's uh, what do they say? It's better to love and to love and lose than never have loved, uh, you know, before or whatever. Loved it all. Yeah, yeah you have to. You got to understand that about you know reaching goals is that you may not reach them, but trying dramatically increases your odds of getting those goals. Not trying guarantees that you won't. Yeah, it's I'm, guaranteed. It's super basic. I mean, you just got to listen to more R. Kelly. What? what R. Kelly? I believe I can fly. Oh, yeah, 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 bro. Dang. That's it helps me. I I would say uh change your goals. That's what I think. Change your goals. I think a lot of times when people uh, they're so hung up on the finish line and they're that like this person is probably like, Oh, my goal is to build this much muscle or burn this much body fat or to look a certain way, and those are the wrong goals. Your goals are wrong. And and, and actually the goal should be the, the process going through all this and what you're going to get from that. So for example, if maybe I want to get in better shape and I want to look a certain way and that's, some, that's something that I, is a, like a long-term goal for me, like I'm going to set short-term goals or challenges and part of that may actually be failing because there's still a learning and a growing process during that. And if you're seeking the learning and the growing process and looking at that as a win for yourself, then, then the goal is okay, and you're gonna you're gonna mm. be you're gonna be fine, and you're gonna that self belief that you're lacking you'll have because you're like yeah. it's this. I expected that I might not get there. I expected this would be challenging. I expected this is gonna take longer. You know, I expected I would try this, and maybe it didn't work out. That's okay. Like that's when I approach something, especially if it's something that maybe I don't feel really confident in. I go. I mean, podcasting. Here's an example. I remember the day that we all decided to podcast. Okay three assholes that have never been on radio in their life before, never podcasted before, but yet we're super confident that we're going to we're going to be good at podcasting. Well, it wasn't because we all said what set a goal that we're going to be the best at podcasting and if we're not the best at podcasting then we failed. No, it was like we're going to do this. I believe in myself at, at, that I will go through the process of what it takes to get to whatever my long-term goal is and during that process I'm okay with setbacks. I'm okay with sounding terrible. I'm okay with learning that, oh, I was going the wrong way for a while. Now I need to go this direction. So I think re, re, reframing your goals 
is what I would do because somebody like this also strikes me as somebody who struggles with all goals in life, not just mm-hmm. fitness related. So we're we're addressing this like it's a or fitness. Or somebody that just got burned real bad. You know, and and for me, like I could see that as like being, well, you know, what what set me back is like I don't believe in the process anymore. Whereas what you're saying makes a lot of sense where if I can if I can go through and, and scale it down and start giving myself some wins and ramping back up my confidence levels and and overcoming, you know, smaller objectives and, and, and ramping that process to, you know, get back to a place where now I, I build up my confidence. If that's what you need, then, you know, that's a process you have to go through. Right. And, and reframe your losses as wins like this. Right. Okay. So the goal is I want to lose 20 pounds. Okay. So that's the main goal. I decide that I'm going to start to follow the ketogenic diet, listen to mind pump, start doing meditating. Here's a, a group of things I'm going to start doing to head to that goal. Well, six weeks go by and I got fatter. So I'm, am I depressed or do I just, I learned from that. Like now let's figure out what did I do that didn't lead to my goal and that learning process from that, that is a success and that's a win and that's all part of this and that's okay. I think people get hung up so much and, and this goes back to the whole comparing ourselves to other people because you see yeah. something else that you want. So then you set this personal goal for you, which I don't think even aligns. I think it's like there's nothing wrong with having a goal, a target that you're heading towards, but then also being okay with the failures and the misses along the way because that is all part of the process and that is part of growing and learning and treat it like that. So guess what? If you followed the ketogenic diet for six weeks and it didn't give you the return that you wanted, you do, it's not a failure. You just learned something about yourself. You just learned something about a diet. You just learned something about your body and there was other things that probably happened that you hopefully connected the dots to too. So reframe your goals. Yeah. Good advice. Uh, so YouTube, Mind Pump TV, we post new videos all the time. There's fitness, there's comedy, there's philosophy, there's money investment advice, there's, uh, you know, <laughs> we do tricks, we do all kinds of different things. I do magic shows. It's, uh, most of that stuff was true. And uh, puppet shows. But you only know if you, go to the, if you go to it and subscribe. That's the only way you're going to know puppets. what I'm actually talking about. Mind Pump TV, subscribe to the channel. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.